Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Linwood. Whoever you are and wherever you are on your journey of faith, we are glad that you're here. I always call this and the Sunday after Christmas the Holy Remnant Sunday. And it's a pretty good Holy Remnant. We're looking strong. So welcome those of you who are here in the sanctuary and those of you who are joining us online. We're glad that you're here. If you are a guest with us this morning, please take a moment and fill out the connection card. Let us know that you are here with us. And if you have a joy or a concern that you would like to share with the community, you can fill that out on the prayer request card and then put it in the basket up here during our time of greeting. It is the Sunday after Easter. And like every celebration, we are asked, what do you do when the party's over? What next? Well, in the great tradition of the church, we are entering a new season. And the historical church named this season Easter Tide. Easter isn't just a day, it is an entire season. It's seven weeks long, in fact. Seven weeks as opposed to the six weeks of Lent. I think that's meant to remind us that the joy of Christ's presence with us is more important than our self-denial and sacrifice. It's a longer emphasis. It's also meant to remind us that learning to see and trust in Christ's resurrection is a little bit more challenging than giving up dessert. It really takes some time. It takes cultivating new eyes, eyes of faith. But for those of us who do have eyes to see and ears to hear, we can find God everywhere. In the sunrise, in acts of forgiveness, in the hands that serve, in the resilience of life, in the faces all around us. Christ is still risen, and there is a reason to celebrate. So in that spirit of Christ's resurrected presence, we'd invite you to stand. Let's join in the call to worship, join in this morning's celebration. The sound of the trumpet still lingers and the smell of flowers hovers in the air. It is still Easter, though the fanfare has passed. It is still Easter, the pulse of hope, the signs of new life the spirit of peace, the persistent joy. Nothing is quite the same. It, it is, is still Easter. Easter. Let's join in song.
May the peace of Christ be with you all. Let us show one another a sign of that peace. Y'all can just think your own thoughts. Kennedy and I are going to have a conversation now. <laughs> okay. Hi. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Okay. So, last week we celebrated Jesus' resurrection, right? And so after Jesus resurrected, in all the stories we have in the Bible... The word spread quickly, right? Now, like, not as quickly as it does now because they didn't have, like, cell phones and technology and stuff, right? But it spread pretty quickly. And the thing that I wish I understood when I was your age is the different reactions that people had when they realized and heard that Jesus had resurrected from the dead. Some people believed right away, okay? Some people were like, oh, yeah, that's awesome, cool. I believe that Jesus is back. Excited to see him. Other people were kind of like, wishy-washy about it. Other people were kind of like, well, are you really sure? That doesn't seem possible. That doesn't seem right. I might have to like see it to believe it, right? And then a whole other group of people were like, yeah, there's no way. You're just, you're just lying to me. There's no way that Jesus resurrected from the dead. There's no way he's back. There's no way he's walking around hanging out with everybody. Even if I saw him with like holes in his hands, I'm not going to believe it, right? And it's really important for you to realize that people had different reactions to when Jesus showed back up in their lives. Because sometimes you're not always going to be excited when Jesus shows up in your life. Like sometimes it's going to be like, yeah, that's not you, Jesus, because I don't like what you're telling me. Or like what you're asking me to do is make me feel uncomfortable or that's scary. So like I'm just going to say that that's not real. And it's going to be other times where you're like, oh, that's interesting, let me think about that. And you're not super excited, but you're not denying it. And other times, hopefully we have a lot of these times, where you get super excited when Jesus shows up in your life. And you're like, yay, Jesus is here. I feel that love. I understand what I'm supposed to do. But it's important to remember that all the people that interacted with Jesus, knew Jesus, like as a human being, had those different reactions when they heard the news when Jesus showed back up. And so it's important for you to remember that you can have those kind of feelings. That it's okay to like really question it. It's okay to have doubt. And it's also awesome when you have moments where you believe in or are excited. But don't be discouraged when you don't believe it right away or you're like questioning it or wishy-waffy about it. Okay? Amen? All right, let's pray. Grace and loving Lord, we thank you for the presence of Jesus in our life. We thank you that you've created us in a way that we have different emotions, different reactions, different feelings when we feel the presence of Jesus in our lives. We pray that we continue to grow in a way that helps us be more excited, more open to seeing when Jesus is showing up and loving us and leading us down a path of peace 
and love and justice. Bring us peace this week. Bring us love and bring us hope. Amen. All right, y'all going to go have fun in Sunday school. Today's reading is from John 20, verses 19 through 29. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. And he said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. 
Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the marks on the hands, the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the marks of the nails and my hands in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the door was shut, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and have yet come to believe. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're going to invite you to join with us in an Easter affirmation of faith this morning. We believe in God, our source of hope, which though fragile and often dashed, is surprisingly strong and resilient. We believe that hope is given so that we can make each morning with a sense of wonder and live each day in the light of the joy that is promised. We believe that hope is woven with faith and love to form a tapestry of beauty and possibility. We believe that out of suffering and destruction can emerge something new, a new earth with the mark of God upon it. We believe our efforts make a difference and transform hope into bread for the hungry, clothes for the poor, love for the forgotten. We believe the church is a community of hope, living the love of Jesus for all creation and continually renewed by the fresh winds of the Spirit. Amen. It's the Sunday after Easter, so we're going to take a load off. What is a Sunday after Easter? Sunday after the party. Today we do not get to eat chocolate bunnies for breakfast. It's just oatmeal. Back to regular old life, regular old church, no trumpets, heck, there's not even a choir. After the party wears off, Some of us are left with that grand affirmation of hope and the presence of God with us, and some of us are left with questions, wonderings. Sometimes we even call them doubts. We are not alone in that part of the faith journey. In fact, the story that we heard today is the story of some of the earliest faithful doubts. Now, if you were like me, I grew up in a church that lifted up doubting Thomas. We never called him just Thomas. It was always doubting Thomas as the exact epitome of what we were not supposed to be as Christians. Anybody else have that? Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. So I grew up in a church that was all about the catechism, right? We were taught doctrine and dogma, and you did not question at all what you were being taught. If you questioned it, it was for just a second, and then you had to affirm what everyone else believed. Questions were certainly not honored or given much time for consideration. But as my faith has developed, I have come to see doubting Thomas, inquisitive, curious, faithful Thomas as an excellent model for our own faith journey. Doubts are not the enemy of faith at all. 
Doubts are questions, they're curiosities, they're places where God is saying, come along, let's explore a little bit more what our relationship with one another might be. If we don't walk away from our doubts, but instead use them to drive our next faithful exploration, doubts can be the very thing that deepen and inspire our faith. So let's think for just a moment about what Thomas was actually experiencing. So for whatever reason, he was probably not present early on the morning of that first Easter when Mary Magdalene came back to share the news of the empty tomb. If he had been, he probably would have run to try to figure it out for himself. I mean, wouldn't you have wanted to go and see what this woman was talking about? So he probably was not there. And he was not there when the resurrected Christ appeared to all of the other disciples to show himself, to reveal his love and peace and forgiveness. So here we have Thomas, an entire week, living with these people who are overjoyed and excited, talking confidently about the possibility of Christ's resurrection, and he has nothing, no experience to share, nothing to share of his own. And yet, he stays, he stays with them. He doesn't say, everything that you're saying is impossible, it couldn't happen, your experience isn't valid. All he really wants is his own personal experience, something to confirm for himself that this unbelievable story is actually true. He wants to believe it. He's a faithful follower like everyone else. He loves Jesus, he wants to believe that Jesus is risen. He just wants his own blessing. He wants what everyone else has already experienced. I think that he is an excellent model for our faith, and even more importantly, he's an excellent model for the faith community. He doesn't leave. Despite his doubts and questions, he stays in relationship. He shares his actual questions with everyone. He doesn't hide them. And it doesn't seem that the other disciples have any problem with that. They don't try to convince him. Everyone stays in relationship together with their questions, with their affirmations, each one on their own personal journey, but willing to share with one another. I think it's a model for how we can continue to be a faithful community, because we all have questions, don't we? We have deep convictions, things we know inside to be true, and we have questions. I've had, I think, every question that is possible (laughs) to have on a faith journey, I've had those questions. Is God real? Is God kind or is God a little bit angry with what's going on down here? Is Jesus my way? Is Jesus the only way? How does my faith relate to other faith traditions? Forgiveness? Do I have to do this? Because I would prefer to hold a grudge. (laughs) Is self-giving and service really the path to abundant life? Because when I look around, it looks like the rich and selfish are having a little bit more fun. There are lots of faith questions that we can ask, and I've asked them all. And every time I've found that there is something there, some affirmation of Christ's presence that assures me and invites me into the next question. The truth is that there is no proof on this side of the veil. Nothing will ever completely confirm our faith. It wouldn't be faith if there was evidence, right? No faith would be required. In fact, I think if we got whatever proof we think we need, we would dismiss it. I mean, can you imagine an image coming from the Hubble telescope and it was actually the proverbial guy in the sky 
with the long white beard and the long white robe, we wouldn't go, finally, scientific proof. We would say, what an elaborate hoax. We don't really need proof, do we? We need something deep inside, something that comes from an intellectual insight or an emotional reality that confirms for us that this faith really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So today, rather than really preaching, we thought we would just share some personal stories about where we see Christ's resurrected presence, where we see that conviction, that presence that confirms for us that faith matters, that it's real. So to kind of talk about where I'm at now with this whole doubt, faith, belief, resurrection, uh, I feel like I'm at stage three of my faith journey. So to explain it better, I'm going to go back to stage one. So stage one is kind of like I was born until college. And do you all know those signs like on the interstate that says like proceed with caution? We all see those like the big yellow ones, proceed with caution. That's how I approach my faith and my doubts early in life. Everything was proceed with caution. So everything, I would go to God and be like, hey, I, I kind of think you're here with me. I kind of think you might be calling me to ministry. I think you kind of are showing up in this way. I think I kind of understand your love. Maybe, not really. But I need you to like just smack me in the face and give me a mountaintop moment and make it blatantly obvious you're here. Or I need you to blatantly, obviously answer this doubt or this question I have around my faith around forgiveness, around love. And so because of that, I rarely ever saw, like, saw these life-changing small moments, these resurrections in my life of like, hey, this is the path you're supposed to go down. Hey, don't worry about the answers to these questions. Live in this way. It's okay to have these doubts and these questions, but like, seek love and knowledge in little ways in these little moments. And so up until I went to college, it was always like to proceed with caution. And so because of that, I didn't see and capture these resurrection moments. I kind of really understand where Doubting Thomas is. And that's why I loved him until I was like 18, 19. Now, my second phase is just book, Corey. All I did was just study and study and study. And the more I studied, the more I realized I didn't know. And the more I realized I didn't know, the more I realized that, like, yes, a baseline theological knowledge is important. It's important to search a deeper understanding of our mind so that our soul will be impacted for all these questions we have in life. For like, where is Jesus showing up in my life because I can explain theology in this way. And so that helped me move past the proceed with caution phase, but then I got to a certain point with my intellectual understanding of God and Jesus and the Trinity and all these other things that we like to talk about sometimes. But I struggled with making it a reality because I still wasn't seeing it every day in my life. Yes, I could sit up here and explain it. I could explain it to kids and youth, to adults. I could lead studies. But the resurrection in my daily life part wasn't there yet. And so because of that, the questions still arose. But they weren't in a positive way anymore. Because I feel like I could answer them to, like intellectually. But from like a deeper soul level, a personal level, they pushed me to question in a negative way. And so finally, when I got done with graduate school and I started to do ministry full-time when I was 21, 22, I set on a new journey, and this was stage three, and this is kind of the stage I'm still in with the whole doubt, belief, faith, resurrection, like where you at, God, what am I supposed to do next? And I set on one journey. I understood what I was called to. I understood what my gifts were. I feel like I could kind of explain it well theologically. But I wanted to just simply see it in small, everyday moments. I wanted to see Jesus, the resurrection, God's love, all these answers that I felt like I had found in like books and in sermons, but I wanted to see it in small moments. Because I knew from my stage one of trying to only seek mountaintop moments that if I just kept seeking mountaintop moments, if I just kept seeking it through my mind, I would never get to those mountaintop moments because I'd miss the little ones. Because the beauty that I have found in our faith journey is that the small moments in life that warm our heart 
where Jesus shows up with the holes in his hands and say, here I am, this is the path you need to go down, those are truly mountaintop moments, even if they're little ones, right? Because a mountaintop moment only happens when it changes our perspective completely. But the Holy Spirit is always present. Jesus is always present. He's showing us who he is right now here in this moment. And so the small moments. And so since I was about like 22, for the past 11 years, I've been seeking small moments to change my soul, to answer my doubts, to push me towards a deeper understanding in this thing we call faith, in this crazy thing we call life. And so most recently, I've had a couple of different moments that have helped me readjust my perspective, really help me hone in on where God is showing up in my life and in our lives. And so the first small moment I have is every morning I wake up and I walk into my living room and my dogs are hanging out and they're just usually laying or sitting there waiting for me to walk into that room. And usually it's because they're hungry and they're excited to eat or they're excited for their walk. But lately I've been pausing right when I get into the room and I look at them and they're looking at me And sometimes the black lab is drooling a little because she's so hungry, even though it's like 6 a.m. And I realize that the most exciting thing that morning is when I walk into that room for them. But I also realize that that is how God feels when I walk into a space where I allow God to speak into my soul. That God is that excited to see me every morning, for me to show up in prayer and in my heart in my mind, in my soul. And I've realized that I can harness that small moment and have that mindset that when God gives me the chance to show up in other people's lives in the same way, that's going to help me grow even more, right? And so it's that small moment right when I wake up that I am starting to realize, like, God is excited that I am open to having God love me, that I have a little new resurrection every morning when I wake up. There's another instance that's happened in the past couple weeks that I'm starting to really realize it's Jesus resurrecting like who we truly are meant to be as human beings, as beloved children of God, and who I think we're starting to realize this church is supposed to be. And it's happened in two ways. The first one is like these big events we do, like the Easter icon or whatever, and on Easter Sunday morning. There's a couple of people that I've met out in the community through things like baseball or doing sports in the community that I've become friends with. And then all of a sudden, for the first time, they come to the Easter egg hunt. And I never invited them to church. And then another friend came to worship last Sunday morning, and I've never invited them to church. And it made me realize that just by being present in their life and being authentically who I am, who God has made me to be, made them realize, like, hey, I... I think it's a good Sunday to come to church. Like, didn't Corey work at that church? And if he acts like that, then a lot of people might act like that at our church. And then they show up, and it's true. And so that's the first one, is them simply showing up. But then I I saw how we have acted as a community on Easter, and we had a ton of new people here, and how we act like this is their thousandth time in this community, and we call them by name, and we show them love and we respect them, and we're excited that we're here, that's resurrection, folks. So every time I have those little moments where I see someone's face light up because someone new is here, and we know that this is a welcome and safe space for them to explore, that pushes all my doubts away, and that helps me see clearly that this is what we need to do. This is what faith looks like. And so for me, I want to encourage y'all, like, find it in the small moments. Appreciate those small little moments where God is excited that you are just with God. And then apply it to all these other moments because we don't know how it's going to impact somebody. We don't know what they're going through in their life. We don't know what kind of doubts, fears, darkness they might have. Because if we just show up and say, hey, this is me. This is how I understand Jesus. I'm going to love you in this way. That can completely change somebody's lives because it has for me. And so I'm interested to hear like a, a few of your stories. Right. Well, one of the things that I think is that we are taught <clears throat> in general that the confirmation that we are seeking is something inexplicable, right? An experience that is somehow so supernatural, so unique, 
that it cannot be explained by anything we understand here on earth, and therefore, that's God. And I think that that is really misguided. I think some of us are made to have kind of mystical prayer experiences, to have mountaintop moments, and some of us just aren't. We are designed differently by God. And so there are different ways of experiencing God and just privileging some kind of personal mystical experience or a high top moment, I think, doesn't really help us very much. I mean, I've had them. I've had prayer experiences where I felt like God was speaking directly to me, that there was a warmth inside my body, there was a presence very much there. But I've also found that sometimes it's a theological insight from reading something new that suddenly I realize I can think about God in a whole different way. It's an intellectual awareness that can come to me. But more often now than anything else, I see the presence of God in us, in the beloved community itself. And when I think about that, I realize that That's, I think, what the scripture was always trying to say anyway, that Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead was the first fruits of the new creation. And he appeared for seven weeks to his followers who were full of doubts and confusion and joy and questions. And then, on this moment that we call Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes, suddenly there is a whole new resurrection. The resurrection of the body of believers who go out and tell the story in a new way. We were always meant to be the sign of the presence of Christ. Our changed lives are meant to be the sign, the affirmation that we need. And so I did a little research and I discovered that there are 2.4 billion Christians in the world today. I was kind of surprised by that number because we always hear that like, oh, Christianity is declining and people aren't going to church and, you know, people aren't going to church as much as they did before. But 2.4 billion Christians. This means that over 2,000 years after Jesus Christ died, over 31% of the world still believes their life is better with him in it than without. Why do we need more affirmation, more conviction than that? 31% of the world, thousands of years later, still believe that his teachings, his love, his forgiveness, his presence are worth living for. I think that's all the conviction that I really need. And I see it all the time. When we show up and spend an entire day honoring the life of someone who has passed, that's the presence of God to me. When we show up and care for this facility and try to create a welcoming environment for new people to come, that's the presence of God to me. When I hear someone give an astounding act of forgiveness after something horrible has happened to them. That's the presence of God to me. I don't need a mystical out-of-body experience. It's our changed lives that really matter, I think. So we thought we'd take just a few minutes to give you a chance as well. I want you to just turn to a neighbor And remember, this is wherever you are on your journey of faith. So if right now you're going, I am just full of doubts and questions, you can share what's the question that's driving you. If you feel full of affirmation and you feel like this is the place where I see God at work, share that. I'm going to take just a moment to share with one another what God is up to in our lives right now.
Right. We're going to invite you to just kind of close your conversation. And hopefully you'll continue this conversation during fellowship time. We would also ask, like, share with Corey and I, right, what are your questions? What do you want to know more about? That will help us lead our entire community and the worship series and the small groups that we really need to continue to grow and deepen our faith. So a long time ago, uh, Frederick Buechner, a great theologian, said that doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. <laughs> and I just love it, right? Because it gives you a real visual. Doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. And what that means, right, is that if you got an itch, we're supposed to scratch it, right? We're not supposed to walk away from our doubts and say, ah, faith isn't for me. And we're not supposed to just rest in them like they're a place to live. We're, they're supposed to inspire faithful exploration and curiosity, right? So if you don't think prayer matters, try it. Pray and meditate more regularly and journal what's happening in your life as a result. If you're not sure about the scriptures or if they have any relevance, read them. Study them in a group. Find out how they came to be and how the whole canonization process happened, right? These questions are the way that we continue to grow in our faith lives. And so our prayer is that we would continue to do that. We would share more regularly what are really the questions? What are we interested in exploring together, in learning about, in doing together, so that our faith as a resurrected body of Christ might continue to grow? Amen. invite us to join together in a time of prayer. I have some joys and concerns to share with the church community. Um, first, we want to lift up comfort and support for Dwayne Baker. Mary passed away um, just a couple of weeks ago, and her memorial will be May 11th at 1.30 in the afternoon. We also want to lift up all those who were harmed in the earthquake in Taiwan and all those that are working for that recovery, hold them in our hearts and our minds. And I also want us to just acknowledge that in just a few weeks, beginning on April 23rd, our global United Methodist Church will be meeting for a general conference. And sometimes we think this makes no difference in our lives, and it, it doesn't make a difference in how we minister here. We can still choose to do what we want. But this particular year, we have the best chance in 50 years to remove the discriminatory language in our book of discipline and to really, as a global church, become more inclusive and to proclaim the inclusive love of Christ. So I want to invite us to be in prayer for the delegates that come from all over the world um, to shape the policies and the direction of our church, 
that we be in prayer for them and we be in prayer for a witness of Jesus' inclusive love to, um, to be present there. Invite us to continue in prayer. God of the resurrection, we thank you for the new life that you have given to Jesus and to all of us who follow. Through the power of your spirit, inspire us to make new leaps of faith, to trust in your grace. Help us to believe that your love will always triumph, even over our worst fears. God, we pray this morning for all those who are in need. We pray that those who are in need of forgiveness would receive it and feel it. Those who are in need of healing would find it. Those who are in need of faith would discover your peace and your power. Send your peace into the places of conflict in our own lives and in the world around us and strengthen us to bring your healing and hope to the world. Amen. Now I'd invite us to join together in a time of communion, and your words, as always, will be in bold on the screen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. We lift up our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. From the start of time, divine creator, you painted each day with light, fashioned beauty from mountain heights to valley lows, and caused praise to whistle through trees and splash on every shore. When we took to hurrying through beauty, bruising one another, and taking your blessing for granted, you sent Jesus to open our eyes to the new dawn, to stir our dreams for a new beginning. And so with all your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the power of Jesus, we gather at this table, remembering all you have given to us. We remember how Jesus took bread, and having blessed and broken it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, Jesus took the cup, and having given thanks and gave it to them, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, joining our lives together as one. May you find forgiveness and hope here. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and life force of Christ that we may be his body for a world in need. By your spirit, make us one with you, with Christ, and with one another. Bind us together in prayer as we pray the prayer he first taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
We'd invite those who are helping to serve communion to come forward now. And we want to remind you, as we do every month, that this is not the table of the church. This is not the table of the United Methodist Church. This is Christ's table, where everyone is welcome to come and receive the beautiful gifts of God. The ushers will guide you forward to receive. If you need gluten-free bread, it's found in the center of the plate. Please take a cup, and then you can place it in the waste baskets as you return to your seats. All are welcome.
We have a few announcements about things that are upcoming in the life of our community, and the first one comes from Linda Van Pelt and our upcoming opportunity to be of service. She is wearing her very famous headgear, and we are ready. As if you don't know what this means, right? Once again, we have the privilege of partnering with Rise Against Hunger this month. Why do we keep doing this? Because it's fun. Because all ages can participate. And because we feel really good after it's all over with. Because almost half of childhood deaths worldwide occur in children with malnutrition, because hunger impacts health, economics, and education, because as many as 783 million people across the world do not receive enough nutrition to lead an active life or to take care of themselves and their families. Last year, 78.9 million meals were distributed worldwide. These meals that we package, they don't just provide meals for the school programs that help to increase enrollment and attendance, but they're also distributed to hospitals and clinics to support treatments more successfully. These meals and other resources are also used in disaster areas. A lot of this you've heard before, but until there is no more hunger on this earth, we're going to just keep doing this. So, how are we going to do it this time? Saturday, April 27th, we're going to package 20,000 meals. You said, why are we doing that? Because a lot of you asked after the last one, why can't we just do more? So we are and also because of the generosity of a donor, we're going to be able to have two shifts that day instead of one, and you can sign up for both if you want, from 9 to 11 or 11.30 to 1.30. This will be in the fellowship hall where we always are. We, because of the generosity of this donor, each shift is $4,000. So this is all being paid for by either the outreach committee or this donor. So we are very, very grateful because this is such a generous congregation. Since we package all these meals in an hour, 15 minutes, actually we usually do it a little less. Our record is hour, 10 minutes. This isn't going to be an issue at all. If we can have 60 people at the first shift and 60 people at the second shift, we're done. Sign-ups can be done online. There's a link in the Friday email. There's a link in the Linwood lines. And then we, Outreach, will be out at a table after each service, I mean, each Sunday service with um, 
a laptop so you can sign up there. And if you just don't want to use a computer, we'll let you sign up and then we'll enter it. <laughs> I think it's also important to mention that the very pers first person who signed up last week was Dan Ashton, <laughs> our 100 and year old. So come on, if Dan can do it, we can all do it, right? So we look forward to having you, hair nets, gloves and all, please join us for fellowship, fun, and also serving God by making a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Lita. Thank you to our outreach team for continuing to organize those events for us. Um, also, an upcoming event this, this week on Friday at 7 p.m., we will have our first opportunity to hear from Pastor Stan Mitchell. He'll also be preaching next Sunday. Um, Stan is a progressive pastor whose ministry is to support and love the LGBTQ community across our country. Because his ministry now happens online and all over the country, he has a really unique perspective to share with us about what the experiences of people really are, what the ministry needs um, of people really are. So we'll have an opportunity to hear from him at 7 o'clock, and then um, he'll be sharing a message message with us on Sunday morning. Um, also, just a couple of quick things. There is youth group tonight, middle school at four, high school at five, and lastly, we have heard, probably because of some of our technical changes, that some of you are no longer getting the Friday emails. And that's really how we share information. So if you're not getting a Friday email, contact our office, contact Nicole, or email her, and she will help you get signed up for those Friday emails again. That's all the announcements. Let's stand for our closing hymn. Be on my faith and on my side No precious words we hear Of him who spoke the thunder's spoke Before you leave today, we want to let you know that there will be Stephen ministers surrounding the sanctuary today, four or five Stephen ministers. If anyone would like a time of personal prayer, you don't even have to share what that personal prayer is, but if you would like to just have personal prayer with a Stephen minister, they will be available after worship today. The risen Christ breathed the breath of the Holy Spirit on his disciples. He commissioned them to be a community of forgiveness and peace and hope. So go into the world filled with that spirit to offer hope and forgiveness to all you meet.
Go in peace. Amen. Amen.